2 has entered the podcast. Welcome, welcome back, people, to Player 2 has entered the podcast. I am your co-host, Michael, a.k.a. MC Paper Stacks, and with me, as always, is my co-host with the co-most. Derek, a.k.a. Full Metal Merc, and we're back for another episode, and I needed it so bad. I'm happy to <laughs> uh, to make that dream come true. We're working together yes. to to get this these video game thoughts news and good times out there to the people the good vibes that's what they need Mm. we Mm. all need it sometimes speaking of good vibes are you the type of dude that like listens to your own show or are you too weirded out by your own voice i never actually i don't think i ever actually asked you about that i listen to my own show like i listen to the podcast with vicky when we're like driving in the car or whatever and i just enjoy looking back on what we were talking about and laughing (laughs) right on (laughs) listening to how i sound sounding crazy sometimes yeah. Because you don't hear yourself how other people hear you. No. Which is so fucking weird. I don't know. It, it weirds a lot of people out. I think I've said it before, but I sound a lot cooler in my head. Then I listen to myself right. and I'm like, who's this fucking nerd? <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I've, I mean, I've been doing recordings of my voice for so long. I have, I had to get over it. So now I recognize my voice in, in two unique modes. Obviously, my everyday voice that I hear when I'm talking. And then I'll hear a recording go, yep, that's what I sound like when I'm recorded, a.k.a. what everybody else hears. Right. (laughs) Speaking of what everybody else hears, you may hear some whimpering, possibly some weird guttural talking. That's my bulldog, Little Peaches. She's down here hanging out with me. The fam is actually out uh, trying to get a tank and some turtle food because my son found a baby turtle. Not four, just one baby turtle. (laughs) So he's going to... Get a rat uh, at the pet store and try to teach him ninjutsu. Pour, we'll see how that goes. Pour some ooze on it. And... Yeah, right. <laughs> pour some ease on. Pour some. Pour some ooze on that bitch. <laughs> Just got a baby turtle. <laughs> Just got a ninja turtle. <laughs> pour some ooze on that bitch. <laughs> Let's go. Um, <laughs> anyways, <laughs> uh, yeah. So they're doing that, and you know, childhood. I remember she reached out to me. She goes, "Okay, look, Ben found a turtle. Can he keep it?" And I'm like, "Send me pictures." I need to see what we're working with. Is this is this like an aquatic it's, it's, turtle? It's fucking Michelangelo. Right? Is it a snapping <laughs> turtle? It is. It's just a baby turtle. I can't tell if it's a box turtle because it's so small. And they didn't mm. get a proper like shot of his hands and feet. But whatever. I told her, worst case scenario, if it's something that's too wild, we can release it by the lake out here. It's all good. So Nice. The kid's been obsessed with pets since we got a dog. Speaking of obsessed with and recently got the thing... Good news for friends of the show. So from Gamer Friends, Big Nakruma, and from Call mm-hmm. It Like I Don't See It, AD, and possibly GD, maybe? I- <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the verdict <laughs> is still out on GD, but I know at least two of them. AD and Big Nakruma both got their PS5s. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. E- even Peaches is excited about <laughs> that one. Peaches is like, that's what's up. Peaches is hype. She's like, she's like, PS5. She loves right. it. She comes down here and just falls asleep. Watch. I think somebody came home. <laughs> but anyways, no, they got their PS5s. And uh, honestly, I couldn't be happier for them. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. It's great. Yep, it's, yep. Just, it's so funny because uh, I was listening to the E3 Gamer Friends episode. They were just talking about, we'll have a PS5 in this house one of these days. Yeah. <laughs> and then they got it like in the next couple weeks. <laughs> yeah, it all kind of happened in a single shot. And... It looks like AD got his and possibly GP from a link that you were sharing in a group chat that we had. So, oh yeah, good looking out for the friends. Yes, I've been out here hitting refresh on these consoles, but I end up getting my own my own little personal win. I end up getting a Xbox Series X from Best Buy, who is still best boy. It sounds like shit. Yeah. Now, when I say I got it, I mean that I purchased it. And it's waiting at the store for me. I'm supposed to pick it up on the 4th. Okay. So this Sunday, 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 I'm going to go grab that bad boy and plug it in and get that three months of Games Pass for a dollar, whatever the fuck they have, and (laughs) take a look. I know originally I was eyeballing a Series S to save $100, but I thought about it. One of the advantages about having an Xbox versus PlayStation that no one can deny, and I think that's kind of amazing, and PlayStation, get off your asses already, because clearly it can mm-hmm. be done. It's backwards compatible. 
Yeah. Every single one of these physical Xbox originals, Xbox 360, and Xbox One games I have, the system will play them. You know? Yeah, it's really, really, really dope. Yeah, and all I'm waiting for is that firmware update, so my PlayStation 5 will play my PlayStation 2 games, but they ain't trying to help nobody out. Mm-mm. Sony, what the hell? We got a few disparaging I would, things I would to say pay about Sony. for a firmware update mm-hmm. for backwards compatibility. I'd be like, you know what? If you guys want to be dicks and make me pay, sure. Fine. I'll pay. I already but paid. It's called the fucking MSRP the, for my PlayStation right. 5. <laughs> I paid a hefty penny for that. So they need well, to go ahead and just cop it Considering I got mine I got mine used, so <laughs> yeah. they didn't get any of my money. Yeah, that's true. And you know what? Good, because they ain't trying to do nothing with it. <laughs> they ain't even trying to do nothing with it. Yeah, to <sighs> so anyways, so... I'm excited to check that out, and, you know, there's a lot of good stuff coming to Xbox on the horizon. There's rumors about some more exciting exclusives. You know, you got the Bethesda thing, so I'm looking forward to it. And again, I think I've said it on the show before. I am loyal to no company. I am not a Sony fanboy or a Nintendo fanboy. People can accuse me of that because I certainly sound like it sometimes. But what I'm truly a fan of is whoever's going to give me a fucking game I want to play. That's all I want. Right. You know, and I get why people fiercely defend their purchases or their Xbox or the PlayStation, because not everybody is in the position to get all the systems. In fact, right. for the first time in my life within the launch window, I can. But normally I do have to pick and choose. because That's just the way it is. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So I get that. But don't mistake the choice that you made and trying to justify that with your identity as a gamer. You can still critique PlayStation, because they've done a lot of shitty things lately. You can still critique Xbox. We make fun of them all the time for not having any exclusives. <laughs> <laughs> but I can't deny that Games Pass is cool, and that they're getting those exclusives. They're just a little bit behind. Yeah. So, uh, Speaking of exclusives and video games, it is a video games podcast, so I just got to know, Derek, this week, what have you had time to get down and play? I've been playing some more Xenoblade Chronicles 2, Torn of the Golden Country. Mm. And I'm uh, about 10 hours in, and the characters are really starting to grow on me. Mm. The voice acting is nowhere near as ridiculous as it was in the original. (laughs) 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 Tora! Daddy Pond! Oh, oh! Poppy Poppy is not, um, um... That was Grampy Pawn. Bo- right. Poppy's not sex robot. Uh, no. Must be program. Mm. <laughs> oh my God. I like your attitude. <laughs> <laughs> right. Let's show him a thing or three. Um, <laughs> I swear, hearing that shit over and over again. Oh my Ooh. God. But even even in this game, like, you know, when you're foraging for stuff, you see mm-hmm. a little bright stuff. Like, Laura, the main character, will say the same thing every single time it's so annoying and it's like can i cut that off i don't know i'm not to look yeah, into you figure that. we would have learned that lesson i don't know like in the early aughts when more games were getting voice acting i remember working at gamestop back in like 2000 2001 or whatever Ooh, it was RIP. like just just after i got out of high school when i was in it might even have been a babbages at that point <laughs> yeah and i remember you know we'd have games in the display and there was like a ninja turtles game that came out around 2002 2003 and there was a move that you could spam, and Michelangelo would say the same thing every time you spam the move. I don't remember what he said, but I just mm. remember like all of us just walking around, passing each other at work, just being like, "It's it's it's time for a beatdown or whatever the fuck he said." <laughs> it just because we would hear it all day long, and right. it got annoying then. But still, to this day, programmers they make the game, they attach a voice line to an action that you're going to do all the time. They listen to it while they're testing it, and they're like, I don't see anything wrong here. This is fine. Yeah, no. We'll be good. We'll be good. No, you're not good. No. I don't care. Just no. record a couple more lines. Yeah. Just like, or, like, like you said, give the option to lines. shut it off, man. You yeah. Know? Ugh. But, you know, it's not a it's not a big deal. It's just like, yeah, come it's on. A, it's a big deal because it's avoidable. Don't you Oof. let them bullying you to accept that, Derek. You say no Oof. to repeatable lines. No repeatable lines. No. Actually, uh, the funny thing about that is the in the original, there was a character that would continue saying, it was an enemy character, he would continue saying, think you can take me? Don't forget me. And <laughs> this fight lasts like 10 minutes, and he just keeps saying it over and over. It was a meme at a certain point. Don't and then they you. actually patched it out. 
forget about me. Yeah, because it's stupid. Right. <laughs> yeah, I know. But uh, uh, overall, I'm really enjoying it. The story is moving along. And I've had to do some grinding because, of course, I turned off enemy aggro. So everybody's not attacking me. Grinding. Like, as soon as I get... <laughs> right. Everybody's not attacking me as soon as I get into the vicinity of them. So I uh, choose who I want to attack. Yeah. So I had to do some grinding and, you know, get my get my levels up. I don't mind grinding so much, but as I get older and, you know, we play games and we get used to the idea, like, it's cool to go back to classic RPG and just zone out and grind some levels, but I really feel like Donkey was onto something when he was doing his review for their latest Dragon Quest. Mm -hmm. If you remember, he was talking about Dragon Quest XI and he was saying, how much experience does this enemy give you? How much does this give you? Okay, how much to a level? That's bad. Because the thing is, the aggro isn't turned off, but you can easily avoid encounters. But then when you get to a certain point in the game, you get your ass kicked because you avoided too many encounters. So then you got to go back and grind. But how long should you have to grind? I feel like I would say 10 to 20 battles in a new area should be enough. You know what I mean? There is a series of kind of like indie games that was developed by a single guy, I think. You can probably get it on xbox live or playstation or even switch or pc for like a dollar or two i don't know if you ever remember playing these games there was one called like breath of death seven even though there wasn't one through six it was like (laughs) kind of like a playoff of old rpgs and having like a lot of sequels and there was another one where you play as cthulhu and then a sequel like cthulhu saves christmas (laughs) they're all all eight bit games i can't remember the name of developer so i apologize but they should be easy to find if you search breath of death or cthulhu in like indie store or whatever. But the, the cool thing that this developer did from jump that I really liked is he had random encounters, but you had a certain limited number of random encounters that would occur. And then once those random encounters occurred in a dungeon, they would stop, but you had a button you could press to request a battle. So Mm. it made it so you could quickly run through what he deemed to be the prerequisite amount of battles in order to get to the level where you need to be like he had designed it that way so that way you could go through the rest of the dungeon and get to the boss and do your thing but if you did want to grind you had the option just by pressing a button and jumping into a battle again i thought that was perfect and yeah and i've seen no one duplicate that so developers if you're listening and i know you are because we're such a popular gaming podcast (laughs) bite that idea or find that developer, <laughs> give him money, and then bite that idea. Like, give him credit at least. But, right. man, just the best way I've seen it done so far when it comes to random battles, for sure. Cool. But yeah, man, that's, uh, that's about where I'm at on Xenoblade. I'm trying to get through it. I don't know what I'm going to play after this, but... Mm. Well, there's definitely a lot of options out there, for sure. So, I would have... A whole lot of fun discussing that with you. All right, well, let me talk about what I was playing this week. I got four games to discuss this week. A lot of them are mainstays. I went ahead and did a second episode on the Pulse of the Ancients DLC for Hyrule Warriors Age of Calamity. And at this point, I have everything unlocked, so I was able to display the two new weapons. Uh, Link gets a flail made out of like ancient technology. Zelda gets that bike. The same kind of divine beast bike you can get in the dlc from breath of the wild then you get to play as a battle tested guardian which is like a tougher version of the guardians that you would find in the game the bike is really cool and so are the flails the cool thing about them is there's three different variants of the weapons there's an attack focused one a balanced one and a defensive one the difference is the first strong attack that you do so now you press the strong attack button outside of a chain Mm mm-hmm My favorite are the defensive weapons because they put up a shield or like a blast of like deflective energy that will deflect beams and work as like a perfect parry if you have a shield, but the timing window is way increased. So if you're about to get hit with a beam attack from an ancient guardian or any kind of like shot from one of those pieces of Ganon mini bosses, what do they call those things? Like Thunder Blight Ganon or fire blight or whatever whatever they're called Mm -hmm. you can deflect them super easily so that's really cool the battle tested guardian is broken (laughs) like Mm -hmm. way too strong way too strong i would put him up there with teba like teba is the only other character i could think of in age of calamity that just is insane with the amount of damage that he can cause and how defensive he is because he can't be hit by 
pretty much anything in the air. But with the Guardian, it has this cool mechanic. If you recall from Age of Calamity, every character has like a unique mechanic on the R2 or what they call the ZR button on the, the Switch controller. Mm-hmm. And if you hold it down for the Guardian, he will start targeting an enemy. And you've seen the target all the time. You can even hear it in your mind when I say target. And he shoots out a red beam. But after a few seconds, a, a targeting reticle will appear on the enemy. So usually you can put this on a boss or a mid-boss or a strong character that you're attacking. At that point, any of your missile attacks will hone in on it. And both your dash attack, which is when you're dashing, you press a strong attack. It does an attack and you can keep moving. That's a beam. And you have your standing strong attack, which is a stronger version of the beam. You can hit a boss from a mile away. It can't even touch you. And you could just pelt it with beams. Not only that. But the five attack combo, so five regular attacks and then a strong attack, will cause a beam to shoot down from the sky, almost like he's commanding an ancient satellite. And normally, if you do that without the targeting reticle, you're immobile and you have to move the beam around manually. But if you have the targeting up, the beam just hits what you're targeting and you can still freely move. So while you shoot a beam down from the sky that lasts like 10 seconds, it's insane. You can then move around and and shoot your own lasers at whatever you're trying to attack and the hp just melts <laughs> it's <laughs> it's it's insane he's super fun to play as and it was weird when i was streaming on monday this person came in and followed me which thank you so much but they kept making a point to say that they're korean they're like hi i'm korean play as the guardian it's like okay and then later on hi did i mention i was korean i'm korean play chapter <laughs> two the Urbosa, Urbosa level, but with the Guardian. And they kept making really strange requests like that. And I was like, okay. So if you watch like the stream, you'll see me just looking at it and going, oh, all right, I'll, I'll play as the, uh, all right, I'll do this level now. I didn't really get why they wanted me to do that. I didn't really see anything weird about it, except for maybe in chapter one, the second battle, you kind of get chased around by a Guardian. So maybe he thought it'd be funny if you fought that guardian that chases you with another guardian i don't know right but he's like show me what i want to see <laughs> hey, I'm, <laughs> hey i'm a man of the people if you come in and you follow me and you're asking me to do something i'm gonna do it so <laughs> i totally i was like yeah sure you got it buddy i don't i don't get many requests so i will play the hits for first time tuesday i played a game on ps5 called werewolf the apocalypse Earthblood. have you heard of this game uh-huh. Yes, I have. Okay. Have you played it? I have not. I've seen gameplay. Okay. So you know what I'm about to say. (laughs) I think I do. Okay. Werewolf, (laughs) the Apocalypse, Earthblood, is about an eco-terrorist group who are also like a coven or a lycanthrope group. I don't know what what you call them. A pack of werewolves? And you, as the main character, you play as one of those werewolves, and you're fighting this company that's basically just destroying the environment to get its resources, and they're like, the world is divided by, uh, I I can't remember what the three components of the world are. One of them is, like, all life on Earth, the other one is the Earth itself, and then the third one is the worm. It eats things and destroys and it got real for a second. It was like, the worm has been growing because corporations are greedy. and They're taking up too much of the world's resources. It was like an allegory for climate change and the destruction of the environment, which, you know, I get that. Mm-hmm. So you start off in a mission where you're trying to infiltrate this, um, I guess, construction site for the company that's hurting the environment. And it goes south and you end up going flying into a rage and killing your pet wolf that isn't a werewolf, kind of, I guess. And also (laughs) your wife dies. Like this all happens in the very first mission. And it's telegraphed so hard. And then because you killed the wolf in a rage, you decide to leave your pack. And then you come back a few years later and they're like, we need help. And it's the story's bad. The acting is bad. The character models, they have that kind of weird early 2000s robot animation to them. Mm-hmm. Where they look, they look like mechanicans that are that are robots rather than people. So the graphics, I mean, you've been saying lately this PlayStation Three ass game. This really is a PlayStation Three ass game. Yeah, <laughs> like oh boy, <laughs> more so than any kind of shade you're trying to throw. It's just true, right? And I don't care about that. The gameplay is good. I don't care. The gameplay switches between stealth and action segments. It's very easy to fail the stealth, but as soon as you do, you're just thrown into action. Except for parts where you're not. 
Sometimes stealth is required, and if you get caught, you just have to start the section over again. And for mm -hmm. the most part, checkpointing in the game is good, but then sometimes checkpointing is bad. You'll see examples of both of those in the, in the uh, stream. It's on honestly awesome to turn into a werewolf and kick ass at first, mm -hmm. but then level after level, and I did about three levels, you realize that you're always going to be in these drab, boring business or like warehouse or production buildings for the the company you're trying to fight yeah. and it's just wave after wave of guys that you tear apart it's like super easy and you're kicking lots of ass and it just you can upgrade your character but the upgrades don't really change gameplay that much or, or not that excited i've never recently in recent memory i've looked at a skill tree or an upgrade branch that had multiple paths. Like I looked at mm -hmm. the whole thing and was like, I don't, none of this excites me at all. <laughs> like it was the most yeah. boring ass skill tree I've ever seen in my life. And it didn't really have much of an effect on how I played other than like a few tweaks to, you know, stats or bars that you use for attack, shit like that. Mm. Yeah. After I was finished, I played it for a couple hours. I gave it a good go. I really did. I was like, yeah, I'm probably not going to pick this up again. <laughs> <laughs> it's just it was it was bad it was boring it was repetitive it had a really cool idea and you could tell there's a lot of lore there they're pulling from what exists to be i, I guess it started started life as a tabletop game mm -hmm. so think cyberpunk 2077 how it started life as a tabletop and there's all this uh lore and all this extensive backstory right so that's it's very rich history you're dealing with and there's a really cool idea that they had here, and they just did not know what to do with it, and they fumbled the ball on this one, unfortunately. Yeah. I think in the hands of a more competent director, maybe a little bit of a bigger budget, this could be something really cool. As it stands right now, who they decided to hand off their license to, bad idea. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. Now, I got it used from Gamefly for like 20 bucks, so it's not like I spent a whole lot of money on it. I think I got my money's right. worth. I can always go back if I want to tear shit up as a werewolf, because I don't have too many options when it comes to doing that other than maybe skyrim <laughs> right, uh, yeah. which which arguably way better werewolf game so yeah just saying the brotherhood yeah exactly so casual thursday and kind of throughout the week i've been playing judgment and i was messaging you about this earlier in the week i'm really getting into the story i'm i think around chapter six or chapter seven now and i believe there's Maybe a dozen chapters in the game. I don't recall exactly how many. So I'm like halfway okay. through probably. Ooh. But I'm realizing something, and this is a problem I've had with other Yakuza games, is there's so much shit to do in Camarocho and so much side content, and it's hard to differentiate which is interesting and which isn't. You get sidetracked, and then you get removed from the story, and then you get kind of, I don't know, you get choice overload, and then you just kind of turn off from the game, and you get disinterested, and you stop playing. Like, every time yeah. I try to start a Yakuza game, I get maybe five, six hours in. I'm like, this is great. And then I just give up. <laughs> so far, I felt that way about Judgment, but I powered through. And then I'm glad I did because so far I'm really enjoying it. And when I get back to the story, that's where it gets really good. What sucks is if I forget to do certain side missions and I get to the next chapter, they're cut off. I don't know if that's because they're specific to that chapter or that time of day or they, they do have their time sensitive. I feel like they are. And I know there's definitely certain things that are missable in the game and that nagging feeling and the completionist in me, I can't move on until I make sure I exhaust all my other options so I don't miss anything, if that makes sense, right. which really no, kills it for me. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm still going to finish it because I love it. But my hope or my wish for Ryu Ga Go Gotoku, how, how, what's the developer? Mm -hmm. Is that? Like yeah, a, I think that's yeah, close enough. I think that's it. <laughs> Ryu Ga Goto yeah. or something. Yeah, something like that. My hope for future games is that they make all the side stuff optional and maybe you can work on it or finish it post-game once you do the main mission and maybe just allow the character to go through all the main story missions first and still have the side stuff and the distractions there if you want to do it, but let that kind of progress separately of the main story. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. because I feel like that that would help the pacing a lot more. I feel like the pacing is constantly being controlled by my urge to want to see and do everything. My fear of missing out, basically. I got a lot of FOMO with Camarocho. Oh, FOMO. Yeah. 
But no, the story is fantastic, and there's really cool cutscenes. I mean, it, anybody that's played and finished a Yakuza game knows what I'm talking about. It's just like any other Yakuza game that you play, but probably one of the better ones, because it's just more recent, and they're more honed at their craft, so to speak. So, right. highly recommend it. Super excited for the sequel now, and excited for Games Pass, because I get to go back through for free and play all the other Yakuza games on my Series X. Woo! Oh yeah, <laughs> Game Pass. So gotta hurry up and do it before they uh, remove them. Mm-hmm. Whenever That's true. I don't know if they're removing them soon or anything. It's just I have a few yeah, for take games off. Yeah, I have a few for PlayStation Four and and PlayStation Three. So if I need to, I'll just play the ones I don't have. Like I'm gonna try yeah. to play them in order, but we'll we'll see. We'll see how it goes. So yeah, that was good stuff. Still playing Resident Evil Village, and I'm getting through it at a pretty decent pace. Every episode, it seems like I'm getting past a new boss. So last week, I met and defeated the gross fishman guy. That was a lot of fun. It reminded me a lot of Resident Evil 4, that big lake mm-hmm. monster you have to fight, but obviously extended. And I don't want to ruin it, but there's definitely some humor and some quirkiness to this boss, which you could see from the early on in the game when they introduce all the main enemies. Mm-hmm. But at this point, I'm heading to one of the first bosses that you meet, that weird guy with the circle sunglasses that heals or whatever. I don't know what his deal is or what his... That heals. Or he controls metal? Is he like oh, Magno? Magneto. Yeah, Magneto. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Magneto, you know. <laughs> but no, he, uh, I can't remember exactly what his power Heisenberg. is. Heisenberg. Heisenberg, yeah. I'm heading to fight Heisenberg tonight as of time of recording, so this will already be up when the episode goes up. But wish me luck. After yeah. Heisenberg, I assume, because that's the last piece of rose I need. Because, you know, I'm collecting pieces of my baby. <laughs> right. It's, uh, baby. It's, a, it's a long story, but apparently she's fine. I don't know. That's what happens right. when you get a bioweapon pregnant. I don't know. Anyways. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so weird, the story. <laughs> it's bananas. But in a good way. It's a lot of fun. It's so stupid. But after Heisenberg, I'm thinking it's going to be the main baddie, which is Mother Miranda. I don't know. I guess we'll see. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I'm loving it. I'm having a really right. good time with it. It's great. Cool. I'm surprised you have managed to make it this far without any spoilers from like anywhere. Oh, you mean yeah? Anytime media like that pops up, I just don't look at it. Or oh, okay. not until like I know for sure I'm past a certain point. Because luckily, people don't seem to be too focused on anything but the beginning because that's where Lady Dimitrisk is, and that You're was right. like the focus for so long. And I was mm-hmm. surprised how fast I got past her part in the game, you know? Yeah, yeah. Which is, is sad, because that's really what we were all obsessed with, so. Mm-hmm. But that'll make subsequent replays a lot more fun, because I get to revisit those kooky characters and have fun with them and play around with the game mechanics and be a little bit less scared and more experimental with how I deal with them. You know, you learn their AI and what how they react and they don't react and shit like that, so. Mm-hmm. That's what I really enjoy about playing a horror game for the second time, is knowing where all the scares are and also trying to figure out what the boundaries are and how I can, that's how I demystify it and make it less scary for myself, I guess. So nice. Yeah. Yeah. Noise, so noise, noise. at this point, I think we should go ahead and get in the gaming news. Cause we've got a few things to cover this week. So I will let you kick it off. Do, 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 do gaming news. Derek, right. what we got? Yeah. First things first, PS plus games for July have been announced. Okay. They will release on July 6th, a plague tale, innocence, for PS5, which is great, because yay. I was just talking about how I want to play that game, and they just announced the sequel, so yay me. Black Ops 4, which is okay. Uh, uh. <laughs> I guess they, they're doing it to ramp up for the next Call of Duty that's about to come out. Sure. Here um, soon. I, I okay. don't know. Uh. And WWE 2K Battlegrounds, which is just the cartoony little body. Ooh. Big head. Yeah, yeah, it sounds cares? like the only thing I'm going to care about is Plague Tale. Yeah, so let me get into that. that. Mm -hmm. And apparently it's been reported that GTA 6 will be launching in 2025. Mm. Oh my god. (laughs) Rockstar does not give a fuck about Mm -mm. (laughs) y'all and y'all next game. They have been milking the same game for almost... Well, at that point it will have been... Let's see, 2013? It'll have been 12 years. Wow. Since GTA 5 released. I mean, Jesus. we usually anticipate a bit of a gap between Rockstar titles. And if you want to get real, the most recent Rockstar title would probably be, was it 2018 when Red Dead 2 Red came Dead. out? 
But yeah, still, this is games. excessive. I mean, again, mm-hmm. it's all thanks to GTA Online. Thanks for everybody that continues to give them money for that. You're part right. of the problem. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, you know, so, I mean, I guess look forward to it if you're uh, <laughs> a patient sage. <laughs> I'm sure it'll be amazing and groundbreaking. It always is. And I hope that the fact that it's pushed out so far means that they're going to do less crunch and maybe treat their employees a little better. Because Rockstar, along with many other companies that have been aforementioned, they're one of the companies that seem to do a decent amount of crunch. And they get leeway because they make good games. And it shouldn't matter what kind of product you release. How you treat your workers is how you treat your workers. So it it needs to be said. I I hope that they're treating their employees better. And if treating their employees better means that GTA 6 doesn't come out until 2030, whatever, man. I don't care. Because it's going to be cool. Whenever it comes out, for sure. Yeah, it's going to be cool, and my wife will be bugging me to play it when I'm trying I'll to play be, something else. I'll be taking the day off. <laughs> hey, I want to play, play Grand Theft Auto. Uh, oh, by then, man, she'll have so much practice. She'll be gamers with a capital G, TM. Right. And by so, then, she'll have her own system. Yeah, she'll be streaming it on her channel. Else. Yeah. <laughs> oh, hell. That would be so cool. Yeah. Uh, my wife's yeah, a streamer. Moving, <laughs> right. Moving on. Ghost of Tsushima Director's Cut was announced for PS4 and PS5. It'll be releasing August 20th, and it'll have a new island expansion, Iki Island, with a new story and new enemies and everything. Mm -hmm. That's going to be $70 on PS5, $60 on PS4. The Director's Cut will feature Japanese lip sync, which is so funny that the English voices for Ghost of Tsushima are the main voices and the Japanese is the oh, basically it's an American sub. game. Yeah. No, I know, but it's you know it takes place in Japan. It's just it, it throws me. No, off. it's it's but it's interesting, but yeah, yeah, people often forget yeah. because it looks so good. I mean, and my when I say good, I mean like authentic. I mean, take right. it from me, Mister Whitman. I should know. Right, <laughs> it looks authentic, <laughs> but no, it looks quite authentic to me. I mean, <laughs> it it fools my eyes. So yeah, you, you it kind of have to remind yourself. Oh, this is an American game, <laughs> right? So, it's going to have 4K targeting 60 FPS. Love it. So Love I, that word targeting. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's like, we're going to try to get it, but, you know. We'll you, see. We have no promises. You might get 40. You might get 30. I don't know. Target it. See what happens. Uh, it's going to have haptic feedback, adaptive triggers, 3D audio, basically all the stuff that we expect from sure. PS5 games now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you'll be able to upgrade from your original PS4 version for $30. Okay, so if you have so, vanilla PS4, not PS4 Director's Cut, but right. the game we all have right now, we can mm-hmm. spend $30 and get PS5 Director's Cut, and that includes Ikishina Island? Yep. Excellent. That kind of plays into the rumor we, we had last week. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's very cool. Ghost of Tsushima coming out August 20th, Director's Cut. I don't know if I wanna, might just wait for a discount. For the expansion to go on sale or something, I'm not really... Uh, I'm down to pay $30, but basically you know. just for the expansion uh, and and because I want an excuse to go back through it again, because I think that'd be a lot of fun. And it's in August, and I can't think of anything else coming out around August that I want to play, so yeah. I think they're going to get me. Now, it's <laughs> important to mention that your saves will transfer, which is good, so you don't have to go and do everything all over again if you don't want to. As far as like going to all the extra shit, like all your unlockables will be there and everything. They have a new game plus feature, so you're okay there. Also, the multiplayer mode, Legends, is getting a new mode free of charge to any owners of either game, vanilla or director's cut. Like Legends is just getting beefed up with a new gameplay mode for the multiplayer part. So that's of note. Speaking of of note, you had mentioned something earlier, which I think I saw a news headline on the Kotaku about this earlier in the week in regards to Dead Space. Yeah, so apparently there's a Dead Space remake in the works from the developer Motive. Mm. And that's about all we know. We all thought that maybe they were going to be doing a Dead Space 4, but it turns out it's going to be a straight-up remake. So this is a company that worked on or co-developed Star Wars Squadrons. Mm. And I haven't played that, so I can't speak to the quality of that game. But I didn't hear anything bad about it. So hopefully if they did a good job on that, they can bring this remake full circle and give us dead space again yeah the tragic backstory (sighs) here of course being that visceral games made the original three dead spaces they were purchased by ea 
and then subsequently shut down when people didn't like that EA forced in all the microtransactions and bullshit in the Dead Space 3. So -hmm. let's hope that EA doesn't pull an EA, and then after Motive makes a decent remake, buy Motive, run them into the ground, and then, of course, dismantle them as well. Right. Which seems to be their MO. I'm a little salty about this because Dead Space is Visceral's baby, Mm -hmm. and... I'm going to think of this less as a Dead Space game and more as just a, a new horror game. I don't even like that they're calling it Dead Space. It's kind of annoying. Like, I get that they own the IP or whatever, and that, that's going to cause it to sell for people who don't pay close attention. But it just, it sucks. You know what I mean? Yeah. If anything, at least hire back the Visceral people to help work on it or, you know, do something. Well, you now he's I mean? working on his own game. So he's like, fuck you guys. He's yeah. doing his, new, his own new thing. The Callisto Protocol. Protocol, yeah, I think is what it was yeah, yeah, that's true. So, I mean, if they come out around the same time, I'm going Callisto or Calypso, mm-hmm. or whatever. <laughs> just mm-hmm. as, just as another fuck you to EA because it, it's kind of shady if you if you really know all the details involved. But for yeah. fans of Dead Space, it is kind of exciting. I'm not going to be 100 percent salty about it, but can I just say, just can I get a, an F E A in the chat? <laughs> yeah, and <laughs> this is EA. this is really random. This isn't news, but I just want uh, if Capcom's listening, bring back Clover Studio, please. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. As a side, as a sidebar, yeah, bring back Clover, please. Side. Bring back Clover. All right. Well, speaking of games, publishers, and developers, and platforms being the worst, PlayStation's in a little bit of hot water this week. Mm. Several sources have come out, including Bloomberg. That PlayStation is pretty terrible to indie developers. I don't know. Several developers have come out of the woodwork, named and anonymous, complaining how convoluted it is to work with Sony to get their game spotlighted, put on sale, or just promoted in general. A lot of headlines were focusing on the fact that you had to pay like $25,000 to get your game featured, but... That's kind of like you're going to pay a pretty penny to get your book, your game, whatever featured on anybody's storefront. I don't want to focus on that. Uh, What I'm mainly focused on is how they have dramatically lower sales on PlayStation consoles than on Xbox or Nintendo, despite PlayStation having a much higher install base. Mm -hmm. And it seems to just boil down to lack of effort to support indie developers via staff and resources. When they try to reach out to go, hey, how can we do this? Part of the convolution is there's just nobody there to support or help them because Sony's focus is on big budget titles. Yeah. You know, I mean, we talked about Sony's focus getting in the way of, I mean, we earlier this episode, how they don't want to do any backwards compatibility. And one of the main guys, uh, the higher ups, just like these games look like shit. Who wants to play these? Mm -hmm. He's not a gamer. You know what I mean? Like he doesn't understand or appreciate history or preserving it, you know like the vast library that PlayStation has, right? Right. And this is just another example of how they're being short-sighted. Because you could argue, well, yeah, they want to focus on their big AAA titles like Ghost of Tsushima, right? Because that's what brings in the big bucks. And that's true. But when you support your indie developers, you not only garner goodwill among other gamers like me and you and people who really appreciate and support smaller games... But also, you end up being able to find your next big game that way. How many indie games or small games ended up blowing up? I mean, think about PUBG and that whole situation. Mm -hmm. And now we have, like, Fortnite going crazy and how Epic blew up because of that. You know what I mean? Right. Any indie game that they support could end up blowing up like that, and then they could buy the studio because they'd have the money. They just recently bought Housemark, you know, that just released Returnal, right? And Resogun. And that they're probably going to do great things for PlayStation. So I, I just think it's extremely short-sighted. And it's unfortunately par for the course with the way PlayStation's been acting lately. And it's going to lead to not their downfall per se. Although maybe if they don't steer the ship around. But definitely their decline. And it yeah. looks like Xbox and Nintendo are coming out on top this upcoming generation. Specifically because PlayStation's just always showing its ass whenever chance it can get. Mm-hmm. Anytime they're on top, they're just like, well, <laughs> you see this? This is my ass. <laughs> <laughs> Check it out. <laughs> right. and it, it gets swiftly kicked, and then, then they get humbled. Look at I just the don't PlayStation understand. 3. I don't understand. You know? Yeah, I don't understand the company's viewpoint. When they're on top, they're like, fuck you all. And then they're, and when they're on bottom, they're like, eh, we'll do all these cool things. Like you can, like when, <laughs> when they went from PS3 to PS4, and Xbox said, 
hey, your your system's got to be always online, and you can't mm-hmm. have use can't use used games. And then Sony was just like, this is how you trade games on <laughs> PS4. And then they just handed a game. To it just comes person. down to poor just, leadership, I think. It, yeah. It just comes down to poor leadership. You could say that for CEOs and leaders of a lot of companies, the tech, the game development, and otherwise. They end up getting their nose bloodied and they learn their lesson, but then they quickly forget it because either they just get full of themselves or they switch leadership and the new person came in like, this is how I ran my burger chain. There's yeah. no there's no passion or care or love for what they actually produce. It's just the money. And when you get mega big, like a lot of these companies are, that just seems to be how it goes. Yeah. And it's not like Sony's known for making good decisions. I mean, aside from video games, are they really doing well in any other area? No. I mean, they've got nice TVs. Their movies, <laughs> their movie division has just been... I mean, they've sort of been bouncing back a little bit. But again, they don't really learn much much from it. <laughs> like, yeah. Other than Into the Spider-Verse, what have you done for me lately? Right. <laughs> so, just saying. Mm-hmm. I uh, I have no loyalty to any of these companies. Give me good games, and I will praise you. Pull some bullshit like this, and, well, you know how it goes. Yeah. All right. On to a better, funner, happier story. Kazuya had his mm. showcase. Sakurai actually took us through. Himself. That's right. Sakurai took us through Kazuya, the new Smash character from Tekken, his move set, and... The music, there's a ton of music being added from Tekken. Did you see that music list? Yeah, it was like, Wasn't there like four, eight, 80, 40 or 80 tracks. I, I don't remember. I thought exactly. it was like over 30 tracks, maybe like 39. It was a lot okay. from like the various Tekken games. I saw a bunch from Tekken 1, 2, and 3 and Tag Tournament and all that shit. So that's cool for Tekken fans. That was amazing, yeah. actually. And Kazuya looks kind of broken. <laughs> I got to say. Yeah, no, all I hear is complaining. <laughs> well, I don't know if it's complaining or just like, how fast is this dude going to get banned? Right. I was watching some exhibition matches with Kazuya today, and he's still getting, like, he gets juggled pretty easily, and people are still learning him. I think when somebody really starts to grasp everything that he can do, he could be a contender, but they did balance him by making him a little bit slower than other characters. Uh-huh. And that does kind of work to the benefit of balance. But I see this character as having like a ton of potential. Like I've looked at Hungry Box, Mewtwo King, Aaron Mitter, Alpha Rad. Like everybody's talking about like how much potential this character has. So I'm just really excited to see like what new Kazuya mains are going to do. And I'm a little bit afraid to go on Smash Online, but I kind of wanted to see what they're going to do to me. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm afraid anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but the other big thing that always happens to these showcases is they release the Mii Fighter costumes, which sounds like it would be fun, but it's really another way to say it is which characters are getting deconfirmed. Because Mm -hmm. if you're a character that gets a Mii costume, you're not going to become a fully fledged Smash character. And this round of deconfirms, (laughs) this round of deconfirms, like, hurt, I think, more than any other round I've ever seen. Mm Mm-hmm. So they led with Lloyd from Tales of Symphonia, which everybody kind of knew. I think that kind of got leaked. Yeah. And he looks pretty cool. They they actually featured him holding one of the sword items because typically he fights with two swords. But he's a me sword fighter, of course. And that was actually pretty neat. And then this one personally hurt me. Everybody else seemed pretty surprised. But I was always thinking this could be a potential character. They had Dragonborn from Skyrim. I was like, no. Yeah. I wouldn't have been into him. (laughs) No, I just thought he would have been a really cool, unique character because of all the dragon shouts and different movesets and stuff you could put in and and Mm -hmm. just introducing Skyrim lore via spirits and shit like that. I thought it would be really cool. I really did. Plus, I mean, the end boss for his single player run would have wrote itself. It would have been Rathalos all day. (laughs) (laughs) I think my dog is over there snoring. She has the weirdest breathing. I don't know if you can hear her. She's over there like... <laughs> uh, I can't hear her. Okay, good. <laughs> Listeners at home, if you can hear some kind of weird nose whistling, that's uh, definitely my, not me. That's my dog. Definitely not me. <laughs> but then the last two, that's what really got the internet in an uproar. First was Dante from Devil May Cry. Deconfirmed. Sadness. And while he was deconfirmed, while people are focusing on that, at least... If he wasn't going to make it into the roster, at least he did get a me costume. That's cool. Yeah. A lot of people don't get characters or costumes, you know? So it's like, and they, I think even after the showcase, 
Sakurai is like, we hear you. We know a lot of you are disappointed. You want to be characters. So we put them in at least as many costumes. I'm like, ah, you know, if you want to look at it as a glass half full, thanks for the chance to even play as Dante in his awesome outfit and sword, even if it's just a me sword fighter. I'm cool with that. So mm-hmm. it's, it's still rough to see. And the last character was Shantae, which yeah. that was mixed reception, too, because a lot of people just knew she wasn't going to be able to be her own character. But the fact that she got to be a me brawler, that was pretty neat. Yeah. Now, here's something for you to think about. Mm. What if this is just trolling and the last character is going to be Dante? Eh? If the last character is going to be from Devil May Cry, I'm thinking either Virgil or Nero. I think. Yeah, I don't know. I feel like it would be the ultimate, like, ha, I gotcha. If a me fighter got an actual, got to be an actual character. If they try to pull a swerve where they announce the Mii Fighter, but they didn't sell it yet, but the fact that you can buy the Mii Fighter costume, I just don't... The, to put that amount of work into it just doesn't make any sense to me. You know, well, how much work really goes into a me costume? I don't know. I'm just, more than I, I think like it's, it's worth not. it to troll people and piss them off. I mean, I don't think that's ever <laughs> their aim. They know that they're going to piss people off, but I don't think they're actively trying to, you know? Mm-hmm. I just, I mean, I, it's wishful thinking to the highest degree. I just don't think that's going to happen. However, a lot of people are like, oh, you didn't get a Sora costume. Well, that's probably right. because Disney doesn't <laughs> want you to. <laughs> but exactly. people are saying Sora. I'm thinking Sora would be cool. I'm thinking it's either going to be another Fire Emblem rep. Hilarious. Actually, no. Right. Here's what I really think. I think a Monster Hunter character might be in the works just because we've had two Monster Hunter games in the last year. Right. You know, Stories and Rise. And then mm-hmm. that secret extra character we talked about because of the <laughs> website coding. Still think yeah. it's happening. I'm like crossing my fingers. That could be Waluigi. So my predictions, the official player two is in the podcast prediction from MC Paper Stacks. The last character, Monster Hunter. The secret character that nobody knows is coming, Waluigi. Wah. Wah. What do you think? Do you I, have predictions? Uh, it has to be somebody ridiculous. Mm. It has Does it to though? be. No, because I, the last character like, in the first Fighters Pass was ridiculous for a different reason. I know, but this is the what was the last character in the first Fighters Pass? Byleth. Byleth. Oh, a yeah. Fire Emblem character. You know, a swordsman yeah. with blue hair. Right. No, I just feel like the last character like that will be in Smash Ultimate, period, has to be like a banger. And I feel like they should have ended with Sephiroth. If this next character isn't a banger, they should have just ended with Sephiroth. And that's why I know it's not going to be, or at least that's not the intention, because they don't seem to care about the ordering too much. Yeah. Because if, if they had that mindset, they wouldn't have ended with Byleth in the first Spider's Pass. I but know. okay, let's say they are waiting for it to be a banger. What's your prediction? I'm thinking, no, not Master Chief, because there's no, uh, is there somebody? Well, maybe Master Chief. I well, I'm Microsoft lent Banjo-Kazooie. Microsoft and they own Banjo-Kazooie, yeah. dude. Oh, yeah. So Microsoft character really? is not out of the way. In fact, now that Microsoft owns Bethesda, could be Doom Guy. Oh yeah, I really, really, really want it to be Sora or Riku. Okay, some sort of Keyblade wielder, just okay. because of the move. The move set would be ridiculous. It would be. Yes, it would be another sword, another sword fighter. But I mean, at you know this what? point, to what's another sword bed, fighter? There's only three <laughs> types of Smash characters you're gonna get. You're gonna get a sword right. fighter, a brawler. You're gonna get the Mies. You're gonna get a, a sword fighter, yeah. brawler, or gunner. True. That's really all you're gonna get. And if you look at the number of sword fighters versus brawlers versus gunners, it's pretty even. Yeah. Or and and hear me out. Okay. A char- I actually saw this uh, <laughs> on the internet that Sakurai was gonna be the <laughs> last character. <laughs> I heard something like that too, which would be super cute if that's true. But no, I think he uh, should get a me costume though for sure. Yeah, but I think something that would be cool is a character kind of like a Mokujin that you pick and it mimics like any character, any other character in the game that's just random. So you pick them just to like have fun. Mm-hmm. So you could do like eight player smash with this, let's just say Mokujin, mm-hmm. and it gives you a bunch of different random characters and it gets different outfits or whatever. I get you. For it. I think that would be, I think that'd be cool. Is that going to be your Hopefully. extra character or the final character? I think that'd be my extra, but my final character would be a Kingdom Hearts rip. Okay. All right. Yeah. Well, you, you heard it here first, folks. Player two is near the podcast predictions. We're looking at either a Kingdom Hearts rep or Monster Hunter rep. That's our pick for the last character. And the extra character is either going to be a 
fighting game staple, that character that knows everybody's move sets, which would be insane to program, <laughs> or Waluigi. <laughs> so that's what we're looking at. We'll we'll see if we were right before the end of the year. So there you go. All right. Yeah. All right. Other news, just as a reminder to everybody, Resident Evil Infinite Dark is coming to Netflix this week, July the 8th. And I think it's about four and a half hours of content if you watch the show all in one shot. Mm -hmm. I hear it gets real. There's an interesting request in the embargo for reviews (laughs) that I I heard about this week on Twitter. People are bitching about it, and for good reason. The embargo states, well, the studio's ask is that reviews not at all talk about real-world events or politics that may have allegorical representation in the series. Hmm. So basically, they're pulling from events that are pretty topical. And it makes sense. I mean, the, I saw shots of, like, quote-unquote, the president, and we're talking about a pandemic. You know what I mean? So right. shit might get real. It makes sense. But they don't want any reviews to discuss that prior to the embargo. Mm-hmm. So hmm. I thought that was kind of crappy, to be honest. If you're going to mm-hmm. do it, just do it. What is this whole thing about we're not political when you're clearly completely political can't you just own it right because we're gonna find out we're gonna watch the show and people who are like oh, you want politics in anything which is just code for <laughs> my politics are unpopular <laughs> they're gonna get pissed no matter what so just let them get pissed who cares yeah i don't know what do you think i don't know i don't think you should really embargo anything if it's in your show it's in your show yeah and if there's well, real I... world uh, allegories then that's what it is I mean, embargoes can be handy as far as, like, avoiding spoilers and other types of shit. You know what I mean? So I get that. But when it comes to, like, telling what you can and cannot write about when you're the one doing the review, that that's kind of fucked up. You know? Yeah. So I, I agree with you on the fact that the whole idea of an embargo is a little, was a little sus. Mm. Uh, like, I, I get it in theory, but this is definitely one of the ways you can abuse it. So. Oh, yeah. Bruchit. <laughs> all right the last story is something that we've been sitting on for a few weeks and i thought it must needs be remarked upon and that is in regards to this whole abandoned game slash blue box games saga so mm-hmm. you were briefed on it recently but i can quickly explain for the listeners kind of what we're talking about if you want so there's a playstation 5 game that's coming up called abandoned and it looks to be from a small studio called blue box games. And when the trailer originally dropped, not many people thought much about it that, you know, they're like, Oh, this looks bad or this looks unfinished or whatever, whatever people on the internet being me, you know, being critiquing shit. But on Twitter, Jeff Keeley put up a gif, like very interesting. And that got people thinking, why is Jeff Keeley interested in this horror game on the PlayStation five? And then people started to think about Jeff Keighley's connections to Hideo Kojima because they're like best mm-hmm. pals. And then they mm-hmm. thought about how the developer of the game or the main, I guess, CEO of Blue Box Game Studios. I can't remember exactly what his title is, but his name is Hassan Karaman, whose initials are HK, like mm-hmm. Hideo Kojima. Mm. And then from there, like this elaborate theory emerged that the game doesn't exist. And it's actually a secret new project from Hideo Kojima, creator of the Metal Gear series. And there's some credence to this kind of fuckery, because if you remember back in, what was it, 2012? I can't remember. When did Metal Gear Solid, the Phantom Pain start to get kind of teased? Do you recall? Oh, boy. It was a while back. Yeah, it was, I want to say like 2014. Maybe it was 2014 or... Yeah, Yeah. I can't remember. Because I know it came out, I think, in 2015. Yeah. But there were trailers where they just called it the Phantom Pain, and they had, like, a fake developer name, and then they kind of revealed, oh, it's Metal Gear. And then, of course, you had the whole PT thing where they released it from 7780 Studio. (laughs) And, Mm -hmm. again, I think the developer, they said, of the Phantom Pain game, they had the first name of the developer was, like, something Mogren, but the first name was like an anagram for kojima like mm-hmm. it was just really <laughs> like he did all this weird shit so it's, it's this is not out of Hide- hideo kojima's wheelhouse to fake a developer put out some trailers and end up being like one of his projects so that's what people were thinking all right followers pretty much set up a community on reddit to examine it it's got over five thousand members just being hyped up and you can go 
and search some videos on the internet. I think GameSpot recently did a good breakdown video. Jason Schreier wrote up an article on Bloomberg. People are really talking about all the comparisons. I think what really gets it for me is the whole thing where they had a Kickstarter for the game, but then they pulled it because they got a private investor. And then Jeff Keighley is really interested in it. And there's all these kind of weird coincidences that kind of connect it to Hideo Kojima. I don't know if it really is connected to Kojima, but I do feel like this game is more than it seems. But Jason Schreier and a lot of other people, just based on recent direct videos from the developer, think that it's just a person who is hyping their game up and then got in over their head when the rumors got mm. out of their hands. I don't know. From, from everything that you've seen, what do you think about it? Anything's possible, man. Yeah. At this point. Like, we even with the whole PT demo being really a secret teaser for Silent Hills, like, this is the kind of shit that Kojima would pull. Mm-hmm. But... I, I don't I don't know, man. It could it could go either way. I hope that it's a new Kojima thing just so I can yeah. look at some weird shit and see some <laughs> Yeah, well there's something to talk about, but there's unrelated to Blue Box, there's also rumors that Hideo Kojima is developing a horror game for Xbox. There's even a petition that's gone up from a lot of angry gamers that are like I guess are own PlayStations because of Death Stranding. I don't know why. They're, they're like, don't make it for Xbox. Ugh. And it's just like, shut up. <laughs> like, right. That's what he wants to do. If they're giving I him can't money. believe this. Yeah. I do not think Abandon is anything to do with Silent Hill. I really don't. Okay. Unless, okay. unless Konami is being a huge dick and they're playing into all these rumors and Hideo Kojima is not involved and they just tap this small studio to do a Silent Hill sequel just to spite him, which seems mm. kind of fucked. But Hideo Kojima is definitely not involved. If it's not Silent Hill, he might be involved. But if it is Silent Hill, he's definitely not involved. Because his relationship with Konami is pretty damaged. There were rumors for a while that all of it was staged. And Konami and Kojima were doing this elaborate trick to eventually. But obviously that all fizzled out years ago. It's kind of fun to follow and speculate. And stuff just keeps coming out to either debunk or bring pull people back in. He yeah. either tweets directly from Blue Box or more shit that Jeff Keighley or Kojima says. Like, every time they get asked about it, it just seems really weird and evasive. So, I don't know. Like I said, there, there are articles and videos out there. Check it out. You decide. They pushed back the series of new trailers and kind of the reveal. They had, like, an app that was going to have a collection of trailers for this game that was supposed to release late last month, late in June. Mm-hmm. That's pushed up to August, so come August, we may learn some more information about it. I'm going to be giving it the side eye for sure, because if anything, it's a new horror game. And what I really hope is that if it is just a small studio putting out a a baby horror game with a little bit of private investor money, that people aren't too harsh on the developer for it not meeting their expectations. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because I haven't seen any active attempts to try to play into this conspiracy just to get the game more publicity. I think it's all coincidence at this point. At least that that's the impression that I'm getting. So we will see either way. Hideo Kojima is working on something. My excitement for a Hideo Kojima project is tempered by how shit death standing death stranding was (laughs) death standing around. (laughs) Right. More, more like death walking. Right. Right. <laughs> but no, it. And, and when I say shit, I don't mean if it was a first attempt by an unknown developer, I would have the same critiques, but I would be more soft on it because it's still mm-hmm. ambitious. And I'd be like, you know, maybe if they pull this back and, you know, blah, blah, blah. But Hideo Kojima is a veteran and he's made coherent games, even if they have been on the wacky side, which is why I actually love him. I love Metal Gear for how fucking crazy it is. But Mm -hmm. this was like Kojima, the auteur, unleashed. No one stepping (laughs) in to go, dude, no, 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 bad. Don't do that. that. Stop that. And the fact that he's coming out with the director's cut. I know I said on Gamer Friends that I'm not going to be playing that, but I I have this morbid curiosity about it that if it goes quickly on sale, which it probably will, I might pick it up and try it out. I don't think I'm going to finish that game for a second time because Jesus, but Mm. (laughs) it's something that I might check out just to see what possibly, you know what I'm really hoping? I'm hoping he fixes it. I hope the director's cut is actually less of the game and somehow more streamlined. And he took all of the criticism to heart and went, you know what? Maybe I should have listened to my friends 
or my team when they said kojima that's a bridge too far maybe i should have pulled back a little bit here's that game right. that's wishful thinking <laughs> to yeah. the nth degree but <laughs> who knows we'll we'll see I will always love and appreciate Kojima for Metal Gear. It's one of my favorite gaming series of all time. I have such fond memories playing Metal Gear. And it's the reason I bought a PlayStation, the original Metal Gear Solid. I played that demo and I was immediately in love. Metal Gear Solid honestly exemplifies everything that I love about gaming in in one package. Which is a pretty bold statement, but it just has everything that I love. It's got Japanese nonsense. It's got stealth. It's got action. It's got a weird ass story. It's got quirky bits. It's got side bullshit. Like I, I I can't really explain it, but it's just, it's just good. There's just nowhere way to get around it. So I could gush. uh, Let's start a Metal Gear podcast. I'll gush about Metal Gear for two hours every day, (laughs) and I'll just be like, yeah, yeah, (laughs) cool. We'll do the we'll do the Derek X Mike. Metal Gear Challenge. I'll force you to play all the Metal Gears. <laughs> oh, no. Don't make me do it. You can't. <laughs> yes, I can. You People can't have keep spoken. Me here. Right. Send, us, send us your messages and, and, and requests, listeners, to have Derek play Metal Gear. Mm. And then uh, we, we, if we get enough requests, then he'll have no choice. <sighs> Speaking of requests, we got some listener questions again. I thought I'd go ahead and read one of them off. In fact, I think we might have a little bit of time where we can probably read both of the ones that we have if you want so i'll start with the first ron b writes in about our overall thoughts on inclusion in video games he was specifically remarking on black characters or characters of color and he mentions you know we all know about the outright sexist history of video games due to them being marketed at teenage boys for the most part for the longest time which is true He mentioned, you know, online play can be extremely toxic on certain games with a lot of people just expressing every ism in existence. But he's curious if we feel like there's a game or games with really strong characters of color. He said, you know, we play a lot more games than he has. And he tried to think of one with a really fleshed out or well done protagonist. And he couldn't come up with any on his own that didn't include games where you use like a creative player. So he's really interested in in well-written and believable characters that are from different perspectives than his own, which I think is a really refreshing interest. You know, there's so much hubbub or complaints from, you know, the gamers with a capital G, the gamers TM, if you will, Mm -hmm. where they just get mad anytime you don't play as a straight white male. And I feel like that's the, yeah, it's the wrong take to have because part of the allure of video games to me is being able to jump into the shoes of somebody else that I may not, you know, normally understand or interact with on a daily basis and being able to see things through their perspective. And you can do that with movies, but you can do that so much better in video games. So I think like this is the perfect medium to expand your horizons and learn about different perspectives and cultures, you know, personally yeah, speaking. Definitely. So I relish the chance to play as different types of characters, but uh, yeah, since he asked, Can you think of any games with characters with strong protagonists of color that you could recommend to listeners out there as well as Ron? Yeah, so not many because, again, there aren't many, hence the question. Uh, (laughs) But uh, one that came to mind was Mafia 3. Now, the main character in Mafia 3 is Lincoln Clay. He's a 20-something black man that went to war and comes back home and ends up all his friends and his family end up getting killed by the mafia and he's on a it's basically a revenge tale Mm -hmm. and i got really into it and i just kind of stopped playing it i don't know why but like lincoln clay as a as a character i really dug him he looked fucking cool Mm -hmm. and he was badass but again like i i I didn't finish playing it and it's not so much a fault of the character as it is a fault of the game and the gameplay yeah, I was going to say like halfway through, it got a little repetitive for me. I think other stuff was just coming out. I think it was just a, a combination of when it came out and mm-hmm. the flow of gameplay. I would agree with you on that because I, I got about halfway through myself. But yeah, he was. A, I remember liking him as a protagonist for sure. So Yeah. Anybody else? And then, we got the, uh, then we got Deathloop coming out, which features two characters of color who mm-hmm. are like the main character. So the character you play as and then his antagonist is a yeah. black woman his nemesis and the character yeah. yeah and i don't know if there's going to be maybe two campaigns that you do or if there's going to be some sort of 
drop in, drop out online stuff where somebody drops in as the female character and tries to kill you or what. I don't know. But if you like Dishonored and anything that Arcane has done in the past, then it's basically the same thing. Only there's a only you play as a black guy and there's a death loop of some sort. Okay. I don't know. I can't. I, I, I want to check it out, you know. Yeah. But, and the other game was from Square Enix and it's called Forspoken. Now, we haven't seen a lot. We've seen a little bit of gameplay, but it's the game where you play as an African American woman and I guess she gets transported to some mystical land and there's like dragons. A world of dragons. I remember right. that, yeah. A world of dragons. One of the recent PlayStation State of Play featured that. She was like, shit. <laughs> right. Is that a fucking dragon? <laughs> <laughs> no so, ending story. Really? Right. <laughs> <laughs> I remember when uh, Stranger Things was on and I said, yeah, they sang this song. And, uh, that song from Stranger Things. <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> and you were like, you mean the song in ending story? Yeah. That's that, that's that but, age gap. <laughs> but yeah, Forspoken play as a black woman and she has like magical powers or something she's in a mystical land yeah I'm looking it forward looks to really that. dope yeah, yeah yeah it looks really cool so basically all my recommendations two of them two of the three aren't even out yet and one mm-hmm. of them i didn't finish playing so it goes to show you the difference between games with protagonists of color and games with just straight white males or white ladies white lady and like i was saying in the notes like the white ladies have been killing it in games lately, lately. Oh, yeah. little, they're like the game industry is like we got to inch our way to black so if we're gonna do the white males then we're gonna do the white ladies okay then we're my gonna favorite do white Asians. lady to play as is definitely celine in returnal that was good times oh yeah exactly so you got celine yeah she's you got aloy mm. uh what's her name from control uh what is her name i forget i don't know you got ellie mm-hmm. like that's and four. Abby. And those are, yeah, Ellie and Abby. So that's five. And those are major, big budget games. Huge. Like those are, yeah, those are nothing Three to scoff games. at. Those aren't indie titles. Mm-mm. So hopefully, you know, they'll start, these companies will start realizing that, hey, black people like games too. And not only that, but it's so, like white people are okay playing as protagonists who are different races than them. You know, like, right. Not every, I mean, again, squeaky wheels, right? There's a lot of people that just like to complain and, and their their voices seem to rise above all the rest. But mm-hmm. I believe they're a minority. They're starting to realize that the market out there is a lot more diverse. And yeah. more importantly, the people making games are starting to diversify. So I'll give my examples real quick. I can think of Jade from Beyond Good and Evil. Okay. She's a person of color, I believe. At least from my memory. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, she For- seems of Asian descent. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Fortune. From Metal Gear Solid 2, Sons of Liberty. And what I like about her is she's a person of color who that's not like made a big deal. Like it's she's she's that's like just a part of her identity, right? right. Her main thing is that her father was killed by Revolver Ocelot, but she blames I think she blames Solid Snake because because he's the one that got blamed for taking down the tanker in the beginning of the game. And she feels she's like super lucky and nobody can kill her, and she's like super depressed, and you get to she has her own theme song and She's like one of the people, you know, so she was actually a lot of, a really fun character. Barrett from Final Fantasy seven, which the original yeah. game. Yeah, Japan tried, but the remake, he's definitely, you know, damn near to good. So yeah. I really like him in the remake. Drop you from here. Give me damn near to good. Yep. Yep. <laughs> and of course, uh, yeah, the Zaz from Final Fantasy 13. And he was a great yeah, character. You know, Again, he was a good dad. <laughs> Just like just African like Barrett. American man with an afro and guns. Yep, yep. There you go. Just gotta give him the guns. But at least they weren't attached to his arm. So there's that. Uh, you had mentioned earlier, and you forgot to mention her just now. Nadine from Uncharted. Oh yeah, Nadine from Uncharted. Your yeah, yeah. And I and I was really trying to stick to uh, protagonists, but then I brought up the issue that she's yes, yeah, she's African American in the game, but she's also voiced by a white woman. So she's voiced like, by a white lady. Yeah, so it's kind of split down the middle. Yeah, fair you know enough. I mean? Yeah. Marcus from Watch Dogs 2. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Adam from Streets of Rage. Mm-hmm. And that's all I could think of off the top of my head. But there's there's probably more. To be honest, you're definitely going to find a lot more on the indie side. But also, there I think it's more important not just to 
focus on well-rounded or well-written black characters, but focus on games that are developed by people of color. Gamer Friends did an episode on this back in 2018. I don't know if they've done any recent because I'm kind of going through their episodes, but they went to the Gamer Developers of Color Expo and talked about a lot of really cool games that people were developing there. And so they have expos for that. The when Lady Momo Chan was on, you know, she runs the Anime Gaming Network, and that's full of a diverse team, uh, people of color and people from the LGBTQ plus community that they write and talk about games. And then you have Black Girl Gamers, which we talked about that because she kind of started her interest in that. That's a group that specifically celebrates black women in gaming and tries to get them started on gaming development. So if you really want to focus on strong characters of color, I would focus on those development studios that have those people on their team. Because as you had just alluded to with Nadine, you can have a black character and she seems well-written strong. But who wrote her dialogue and who is voicing her is just as important. Right. Is there any actual black people working at that particular developer? And then you have to consider developers like Ubisoft who say that they're diverse, but then you see how they actually treat the people that work for them. And you realize, yeah, you're not really you're supporting a pretty hostile and toxic work environment at that point. If you're supporting them, not not again, not laying blame on anybody who buys their games. I'm just saying that if you're really wanting to get in the spirit of inclusion, focus on who's making the games and the company that they work for. And I think from there, you'll find what you're looking for. Yeah. So, all right. Mm -hmm. And then the second question that we got was about, I didn't see this video. I don't know if you did or not. There was a video that went viral recently where a girlfriend slash wife is complaining to her boyfriend or husband that all he does is play video games, which is a story as old as time. Mm -hmm. And he responded in the video by saying, it's all I have. And it sparked like a big conversation on mental health and how a lot of guys use gaming as a way to decompress. Mm -hmm. He was just wanting to know our take on that. Um, well, one, that's very sad. Yeah. Uh, and unfortunate, especially considering that he's married. <laughs> that video games is all he has. It's like. That's what you kind of have a partner for is to get you through those tough times. But yeah, well, um, like, I, I mean, you know, I, I can see I understand it because sometimes, you know, you just need to unwind, need to get away from the real world sometimes mm -hmm. because the real world sucks and video games are fun. And they're cool. Yeah. and They're exciting. You don't go in the video game world. You don't have to worry about paying your bills. You don't have to worry about. If you this is this is more not morbid, but it's kind of <laughs> fucked up whether your wife loves you or not, because she's at, asking you why you're always playing video games. Like, it's just, you know, mm -hmm. it's, well, without it's, seeing it's, the video, we don't know what kind of relationship that they have. Obviously, she cares because she's voicing her opinion to him. You know, I think if you don't mm -hmm. care, you've given up and, and, you know, and the fact that he said is all he has, I don't think that's really disparaging to her because, again, just because you're with somebody in a relationship doesn't mean you don't suffer from depression. You right. know? And if it really does spark a conversation on mental health, I mean, I've spoken about it on the show and I'm not going to put anybody else's business out there, but I've listened to podcasts before, actually a video game podcast where somebody openly talked about their depression and it really helped me address mine. I have clinical depression and anxiety. I have to deal with both of them. It kind of fucking sucks. <laughs> but mm -hmm. <laughs> video games have been a way for me to decompress. It's been a way for me to forget about the, the anxieties I have and to focus on something without ruminating too much, which is one of the issues I run into when my mind is left to wander. I was doing that earlier, man. Whew. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I think the danger of anything that you use to help, offset your depression is if it becomes a replacement for treatment and or if it becomes an obsession or something that you end up absorbing into too much because anything can be dangerous outside of moderation even things that are traditionally good for you i mean there's countless studies of how video games can make you smarter or help your social life if you're playing online with other people or help with your problem solving skills all kinds of benefits right but if mm -hmm. you're obsessively playing to them where you're neglecting your loved ones your family your job your health your well-being then it can become an issue so i think that anybody that's listening if 
you feel those thoughts, you know, you're always worried about what other people think, or you're always, your self-talk is always very negative. You call yourself names all the time, or your, your self-talk is always shameful. I would advise uh, that while video games may be helping you, it might be good to go out and actually get some help and be honest with the people in your life that you trust, that you care about. It's not incumbent upon them to fix your problems. It's not incumbent upon his wife to be the person that helps bring him out of his depression. That's his mm -hmm. responsibility. So if that really is all he has, that's the first step to admitting that he needs help. And I hope that he gets it. So oh, that, yeah. that's what I would have to say about that. But yeah, I think video games for me personally, have been a huge help in tempering my depression back when I didn't have the tools, the money, or the wherewithal to treat it properly. And now that I have, it's still a big part of my life and a big love of mine, but it, it did get me through some really rough patches in life. And yeah, I, I would say that there were times where it, it almost became too much of a crutch, and that can be a danger with a, a hobby, any hobby, really. Mm -hmm. So... Okay, getting deep on player deep. two. Player deep. two is entered the mental cast. <laughs> right. <laughs> Ooh, going deep. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> down. Down. That's too horny. <laughs> hey, I just wanna I just wanna inter intervene. Our friend GP has confirmed that he got a PlayStation 5. Woo woo! PlayStation it's 5. All real. The Driptastic Four have ascended to godhood. Yes, we all four of us. Together. Yes. <laughs> all four of us have our PlayStation 5s, and we That's will be so playing crazy. Ghost of Tsushima in August. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> That's great, man. With Uncle Daddy. <laughs> Uncle Daddy Shimura. Miss him. <laughs> Love him. I know that you killed him. I let him live. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to say R.I.P. <laughs> <laughs> not not, not for me. Him indeed. <laughs> no, I'll let him live. I was like, you're oh, going to live no. with, with being a, an asshole, and you're going to have to sit and think about what you did to me. Mm, you're going to marinate <laughs> that shit. <laughs> well, spin is, uh, speaking of sitting and thinking about what you did and marinate, you feeling anything this week? Earlier, you weren't. I was just checking in. Yeah, honestly, no, man. It's just been a very long and stressful week. I I'm feeling this long weekend. How about that? That I'm works. feeling it. My mom's taking my uh, daughter... For like basically the whole weekend starting tomorrow, and it's just gonna be nice to. I'm just feeling have grandparents, some... right? <laughs> for exactly. <the> win. <laughs> Man, she be coming through. Yeah, and she and, and I love when. Okay, yeah. So I okay, I'm feeling my mom's relationship with my granddaughter, like the fact that she you mean wants mean your to daughter because so you don't much. have a granddaughter yet. Oh shit! I hope not. I'm feeling <laughs> I'm feeling my mom's relationship with my daughter. Mm -hmm. because she actually asked, she actually asked me if she could take her mm -hmm. for the weekend. Mm -hmm. But my mom is just always like, can I get Nora for the weekend? Uh, hey, you want to bring Nora over? Blah, 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 blah. How's Nora? And I just love it. I love it. Mm. Like, I don't have to force my child on her, and it's great. That's awesome. No, that's great. Yeah, yeah Ben I love hangs out with his I grandma Monday mom. through Friday while we're working, and it's awesome. Well, as far as what I'm feeling, it's something kind of domestic, too. I'm just feeling working from home, man. Yeah. And I'm a little upset because my job, along with my wife's job and many other people's jobs out there, these boomer-ass CEOs are just arbitrarily mm -hmm. deciding that it's time to go what they call back to work. Bitch, I've been working. Where you been? <laughs> what they mean is go back to the office so they can look over our shoulder and make sure we're working. But the thing is, if the shit got done, the numbers are up. Every time I get a review, they're like, man, you, you out here setting the curve, Mike. Good job. High five. Cool. Why the fuck do I have to go back to the office then? Why do I got to spend hours out of my day not getting paid trying to go to and fro to this office for some work I could easily do at home because I proved that I could? Right. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So that's that's what I'm feeling. I'm feeling working at home and I'm at a standoff now because I have a deadline to go back into the office in November and at this point, I think I'm just going to quit. <laughs> I think that's where I'm at. So we about to we about to see what we're going to do. But if anybody's listening and you're hiring and you want somebody with my particular skill set, which is an obsession with video games, <laughs> at me. Slide into those DMs. I will, I will write for you. I will edit for you. If you need something edited, I will do that shit. Please. If you have any kind of work you need done... I don't even need to make that much money, to be honest. We're doing okay. Just we'll, give me we'll work something. From home. 
We'll we'll work from home. Give me something that you need to be done at a salary that you feel is fair that you can afford, and in all likelihood, I'll probably take it. So just saying. <laughs> shameless plug. And that is shameless plug is what I'm feeling. Speaking of shameless plugs, we're gonna go ahead and take some time for our ad, and then we will be back to close out after we hear a word from our sponsor. Be back soon. All right, and we're back. What a wonderful ad that was. It's the same mm. ad we always play. Maybe somebody Beautiful. will actually, somebody else will actually take notice. Who knows? In the meantime, to pay those dues, Derek, if the people are interested in them gamer goodies, possibly more, where can they locate you at? Check out the stuff you have in your store. So they can check out everything I have for sale at ebay.com slash str slash gamer goodies and more. They can follow me on Instagram at gamer goodies more and Twitter at goodies underscore more. I'm posting stuff, trying to post stuff every day, but you know how life goes. So, mm -hmm. you know, I do it when I can. So check me out. I think you're doing all right, man. Well, also, you can find us at our main hub at anchor.fm slash player two is enter the pod. And we post episodes every single Sunday. We can be listened to at that hub or anywhere you can find podcasts available. That includes Breaker, Google Podcast, Overcast, Pocket Cast, Radio Public, Apple Podcast, and Spotify. You can also find us on Facebook and YouTube. Facebook.com slash Player 2 is entered the pod. The YouTube channel is called Player 2 is entered the podcast. And we put notifications of new episodes as they drop if you'd like to subscribe or follow us there. You can follow me personally. I'm on Twitter at Mike Peterson AL, and I also do Twitch streaming, twitch.tv slash mcpaperstacks, and you can check the schedule, but I typically stream Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Fridays. And finally, we have a Patreon. So if you'd like to support our Patreon and consider throwing a few bucks our way to help support the show, all that money will go back into the show to make it even better experience for our listeners. You can visit patreon.com slash player two is under the pod. And check out the different tiers to see if something interests you and helps support us. We'd really appreciate it. And that is our show. And what a show it was. And we'll see you guys next time. All right. Love you. See you next week. Bye-bye. Peace.